<laughs> Look at that. Jazz in B flat, everybody. <laughs> beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Um, welcome to a very special episode of Anderton's TV, uh, where I have the delightful Dan Steinhardt and the wonderful Mick Taylor joining me from um, That Pedal Show. Would you like to introduce yourself, chaps? Yeah. Welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. But we're... Oh, oh man. We should we uncross the strings? <laughs> I, 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 it's I just, think this is amazing. How bad are the prescription lenses in those? Are you, are you actually, completely headached I, up I now? I actually not thought you were proper crazy blind. Probably blind. blind. I am, but you're I am. not. I'm so overdue, <laughs> so overdue a prescription change. Ah, <laughs> uh, well look, it's lovely to have you both here. Um, well, thank you for having us on, man. This is amazing. This is a trip. Yes. Yeah, it really and, is. And as you know, Captain Meats is where we get some of the very, very, very best guitar players in the world to come onto the show. So it is a special <laughs> exception show today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said it. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, I thought, you know, everyone will know you guys from uh, that pedal show because it's been such a success and they might know a little bit about you from your guitarist magazine days and a little bit about you from your sort of gig rig and uh, here and excursions here. Done, yes, my, and done here. my fair share here as well uh but i you know let's get let's go deep oh Let, let's get let's go deep and um i guess the, the i love talking about the sort of formative years for you you know f background family life and what inspired you to to uh to play so Blimey. for no other reason other than uh you were born a lot further away than mick should mm. we start with you then dan tell us about yeah. life oh okay uh I, from a very young age, I was fascinated with guitar sound. I think that the story goes as far as I'm told. My mum was learning to play guitar when she was pregnant with me. Wow. She stopped when she couldn't reach the guitar anymore. <laughs> um, and when I was three years old, my brother got one of those, like, uh, you know, the really cheap guitars in those triangle cardboard boxes that you give a kid for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he pulled it out of the box. He's got 20,000 of them. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. <laughs> and he pulled it out of the box and he strummed the strings. And I had a, this crazy emotional reaction to that sound. And mum had to get me a guitar because I just wouldn't shut up. I didn't um, care about anything. What age is this, sorry? Three. Three. And it's just something about re the, the recognising of that vibrations. I think, you know, but the weird thing is I didn't, my family was singers. But, you know, my dad didn't listen, didn't listen to Zeppelin or anything like that, you know. So I didn't really get into rock music until much later on. I mean, I thought, literally thought I had invented tapping. And then I heard 1984 by Van Halen and end up crying in my room. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the whole um, the rock thing sort of came. And, and by virtue of that, I was always a guitar player first music second so yeah. certainly in the beginning the music came later for me right but i've always been fascinated by just the the sound of the guitar and how it does what it does and i and um it's been you know you know growing up and playing in bands and touring and, and all that stuff uh it's just been a part of my life you know, ever since i can remember you know for me personally i think it's fair to say that, you know, I, I can play fine, mm -hmm. but when I'm really connected to the instrument is when I can pull something out. Right. But unless I am, I really struggle. Yeah. And I think that's what led me down the sort of path that I've chosen because I found things that helped me connect. That chose you. That chose me. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, you know, just, uh, and that's how we got to the whole. And, and you were... I only say this because my daughter's five and I got her her first guitar the other day and it's borderline been it's certainly a waste of time trying mm. to, to do a yep. st structured sure. learning at that age sure. you know, I still quite like the idea that she has it and bash it around but, but you can you sound like you were picking it up super super young oh I couldn't so. from that day from that yeah. Christmas day yeah um, I think it was it was years later before I had a day from not playing. I just couldn't, wow. it's just being, just plucking the strings. And I remember the day that I could go, na, 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 and, 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 then, and then pick out where the notes were. Because I, you know, I never forget that I was like 10 and realized that I could, you know, hear chromatically where the notes and stuff were on the guitar. Um, so what went wrong then? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, why aren't you as good as Guthrie Govan? <laughs> you know. The only other guitar player I know who said he started playing at three. Yeah. You know. well, well, yeah, but I think, I think, you know, Guthrie 
one of the things Guthrie says he was surrounded by music I think from yeah. you know, I, I, and even though there was music it wasn't there's a funny story that um, my mum had a Dolly Parton album and my stepdad I think he had a he had a um, a kung fu an album of kung fu sounds right, right? <laughs> From the like, 70s kung fu films. And this, this, I can see now where your guitar influence yeah, yeah. Uh, is coming from, absolutely. And it's like, like we, so, so. Working nine to a <laughs> it was, And it was, it was, the, so the, 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 the amount of music I had, apart from radio, you know, but the amount of stuff we had was, was kind of limited. Right. But then my brother got into, you know, um, Australian bands and then he, and he got into Yes and a few of these things and started bringing these albums home. Right. But that was, you know, sort of much later. But, you know, I think. In our home now, the kids are surrounded by music, and it's very different. I think mm. by the time a child is, you know, by the time the child has exited its toddler years, um, there's well, there's a really good argument for having if if mm. you're a musical person and having music around the house, they absorb so mm. much of that, you know. But yeah, for me, it's always been guitar first, you know, music, not music second, but the guitar definitely came first. Interesting, and then so we'll 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 kind of pick up your, you know, perhaps some of your teenage years and things like that. But again, Mick, I'm kind of interested how you know. I see you all three, and I'll give you a two. (laughs) Oh, really? I'll I'll send. I'll send. um, (laughs) If Taylor's going to edit this, I'll send you a a a picture of me at two years old with a little guitar, and they they got me this little guitar because my dad plays guitar and sings, and is very passionate about country music and playing and singing. Ah, that's amazing. And. they got me this little, you know, toy guitar, and I apparently the story goes left-handed. There I was uh, playing it, and I was I got so angry with it, and I smashed it and I broke it, which you know kids smash and break everything, right? Yeah. But and my dad kind of twigged, and he thought I wonder, and he got another one, and he tuned it to a chord, and he said from that moment I couldn't put it down. Ah. You're naturally left-handed, are you? Well, as a kid, I didn't know any different. But if you write left-handed, do you? No, 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 oh, okay, I, I am fine. right-handed, right, but the right, picture right. is I'm holding the guitar right. the wrong way. So, um, sorry, I'm holding the guitar left-handed. Um, it is the wrong way. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> Unless you're Jimi Hendrix, then you can hold it any way you like. Uh, or, yeah, or Doyle Bramble. Or, yeah, yeah. 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 or Eric Gale. <laughs> do, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, forget Abe. Three of the coolest that, yeah. people on the planet, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, so apparently that was that. And then... Um, it was always around so my dad always had an acoustic guitar kicking around and maybe like a hollow body electric Um, so the same as Dan it was that fascination with the sound Mm. Um, and then I don't really remember much well I don't remember obviously I don't remember that but the next time I really remember engaging with guitar was around about eight years old because our house was full of country and western music Mm -hmm. and that's all we listened to Wow! because my dad is a massive Johnny Cash fan like yep. off the scale, you know, proper, full on syrupy, Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn. Oh really? Proper hardcore seventies country. country Wayne Jennings, you know. Yeah. And, and zero kung fu albums. No kung fu albums okay. that I was aware of. <laughs> the best thing about the kung fu album was you'd listen to the one side, you'd be oh yeah, and that stuff. Then it finished, and it turned over. It was just the sound effects. Which is the, effect album, which is the sound effects from kung fu films. <laughs> I love it. I'm just going to relax tonight, darling. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, so then, and then uh, about eight or nine, my friend Matthew Smith, who lived in the village um, where I lived, was a drummer. And his brother Kevin was a guitar player. And his brother Kevin had a Fender Strat, a real Fender Strat. And this is, so I'm eight years old, so it's 1980. Because I'm so good at maths, too. Right. Um... And it, that was like, it was it was literally like seeing something from outer space. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure all you kids today, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that anyone who's grown up in the internet age mm. realises how rare those things were. Because the only place you saw them was on telly. So to actually see one in the flesh was like... Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I think I go... I think it freaks me out even more. My dad tells me stories from when Anderton's opened in the 60s where... If you had one Fender guitar right. in stock, people would drive from yeah. fifty miles away to see. And they see were like a year's money as well, weren't they back then? Yeah, or I don't, half a year's I don't money. know. I don't. Yeah, certainly weeks and weeks, maybe months of money. Yeah. Not mm. like you know, not like today. You know, where Squire Strat is a day's money or you know yeah. whatever. Um, 
So yeah, so anyway, and then to finish that story, my yeah. mate Matthew and his brother Kevin and his brother Darren had this loft in their house where they could hang out and play music. And we were up there one day and he had um, Black Sabbath, <laughs> I think, and maybe Highway to Hell. I don't know what year Highway to Hell came out, so I was that old yeah. by this time. And I heard that and I was like, yeah, this is an escape from country music. I need to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Cue the next Christmas. Next Christmas, I get a KSG copy and one of those K, uh, I don't know if you remember them, plastic amp. Uh, right. It was a plastic framed amp with, oh. a, with an oval speaker. No I, no, I don't remember those at all. Yeah. So, an actual oval speaker or just like an oval hole for the speaker? No, an oval yeah, speaker. I, I remember the oval speakers. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And a KSG copy with the bolt on neck. Never look back. I was, I, I, See, I, I was I, I, I mean, that was going to be my you had, sorry, next. Sorry, an SG copy with the bolt on neck. Yeah. It was your first electric. Yeah. That was mine as well. Really? <laughs> yeah. I was 10. It's I, weird because we share a Kramer in the past as we, well. A Kramer striker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was going to be my kind of next question. But what, and you, you kind of answered it with the sort of the Angus Young kind of thing. But who was the, 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 who was the first person that you can actually remember seeing with a guitar on the neck that you just went, okay, everything makes sense now. That's the mm. journey. I Quo and Angus Young for me. Uh, and what about you? Steve Vai. Really? What? Yeah, well, you know, I was... Are you, I apologies, are you younger or older than Mick or similar age or... I'm older than Mick. <laughs> so, but Steve Vai is later than... Yeah, no, I see, I didn't... But, uh, so, because putting it in context, I, you know, like I said, I didn't grow up with these guitar heroes around me and, and you know, and... My dad was very religious and rock music was from the devil. Oh, okay. So I was literally not allowed to listen to that stuff. But it was... Um, Kung Fu was okay. Kung Fu but... was fine, you know. Uh, <laughs> Spiritually <laughs> awesome. Spirit, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I remember, um, you know, and, you know, I'd hear the radio and, and stuff and, you know, start listening to the albums my brother brought home. And, and I heard Flexible. Right. And so oh, I've been listening to... I've been listening to... Uh, there was a Yes album that I was... I think... From a very young age, um, harmony had always really piqued an interest in me. Yeah. Uh, and and I heard Flexible and I thought, this that, is amazing. That's Steve Vai's first solo album. That's because, is this pre, this is post Zappa. After Zappa. But, but pre that, David Lee Roth, Flexible? The, the yeah, because that's Roth. the one that almost no one will know, you know, of Steve Vai, unless I guess you're a hardcore Steve Vai fan, but that... You know, he got massively famous as a guitar hero post David Lee Roth, really, didn't he? As, yeah, you know, and see, so yeah, for me, and it yeah. was mm. it was Edom and uh, not uh, yeah, Edom and Smile, the, the the first album with David Lee Roth, I think, has some of the greatest recorded rock guitar tones ever, right. and some of the most amazing, free, brave guitar playing. I mean, you know, that for me, you know, everything that I'd wanted to be mm. was. You know, in flexible and eat them and smile was just like wow, um, and yeah, and I think, and then I had to work backwards from there because I was literally about to say you've got, you know, Mick's journey is to aspire to be a guitar player that I would have thought, you know, rel one, you know, if, as long as you can play E A and D, mm. all of a sudden you're going well, I I, I could I I might sound a bit like a AC DC tune, and it must have been quite sort of not, not off-putting. You're not sort of thinking, oh, I'm never going to be able to play like that. But you've gone in at a level where you're absolutely the first few listeners who... Just, how I, could I you don't ever? know how much you're aware of that. Before you know anything about playing the guitar, I don't know how much you... how hard you realise that something is right. or isn't, maybe. Mm. I mean, I, I, I remember when um, Passion and Warfare came out, I, I, listened, I was going on a train to Poole, and I was however old I was, 16 maybe, and I ordered an Ibanez RG550 from the local uh, music store, waited six months for it to turn up, literally mm, six months. Mm. And I kept it for four weeks and sent it back because I couldn't keep it in tune. Well, and I had one of the first gems in Australia. Yeah. I had you know, one of the first batches that came over. And, and I had um, a, a Roland GP8, you know, in one of the yeah. first multi-effects units. Because I had assumed at that point that state of the art meant sounded the best. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have anything else to judge it by. Um, 
and as passionate as I was about great guitar sound, I had struggled so much in these years to try and get mm. a big guitar sound. Try and you know have. But something. you could play exactly like Steve Vai at this point. I, I, I <laughs> absolutely couldn't. But I, I, I was doing. You know, I was. You know, I walk into a music. If I walk past the music stop, a music store, I'd have to go and grab a guitar for the wall. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. Whoa. Um, <laughs> but so, but for for me. Nothing's changed. I had to get all the, you know, it was like, well, state of the art, it, you know, it must be me. You know, there's got something wrong with what I'm doing. And it wasn't until I worked with a producer back in the, in, in the 90s that brought in a bunch of old analog effects mm. pedals. I, and I plugged in an electric mistress for the first time into a um, Blackface Deluxe reverb. And mm. I just went, and my world changed from that moment on. And it just... It blew my mind how this thing that was made in the seventies, yeah. you know, because I had a I had a flanger in my GP8, and that's you know that was much newer than this. Yeah. It was like it sounded not in the same universe as this thing, and I and I couldn't believe it. So everything stopped for me from that moment, and I had to work out what was going on. It is interesting but, that he leaps straight to guitar sounds because you're talking about playing, and he's leaping straight to guitar sounds. But I, think, but I think, yeah, for me, because I did, I don't ha I but have it, the, all the reference of those guys. That but it says a lot about the inspiration of why you pick up a guitar and play for you personally, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Whereas mm. I think for a lot of other people, it's they hear, a, they hear a phrase and they want to be able to play that phrase. I tried to play Stevie Ray Vaughan for years. I thought I was really good at Stevie Ray Vaughan. You are really and good. And only now I'm 44 years old do I realise that I was playing it absolutely all wrong and I still am. So it, there's learning that comes with yeah. it. But I was, the same as him, I was more interested in the sound. It was the sound mm. that, that, that made me go, I want to do that. Mm. Don't care yeah. about the notes, I just want to do the sound. When you walk into a gig, uh, you know, I think for me it's been a while, because the gigs I used to go to were loud. Mm. It's been a while since I've gone to a really great loud rock gig. But I just remember walking in to see, um, so Tommy Emmanuel's brother, Phil Emmanuel, back in the day, who passed away recently. But I'll... Um, I knew the bass player in the band and I walked in and, and heard this unbelievable guitar sound. It was like it had pinned you to the back of the wall. It was like, and I just couldn't help but feel so inspired and, and it was joyous. and Yeah, that's know, interesting. Uh, and you'd go to these venues and you know, just remember, you know, 17 sneaking into clubs Um where there was a live band on, and just specifically, with, you know, to hear the band, hear what it sounded like, but then to listen to, to see what the, was going on with the guitar. And there was, you know, there's a, a number of bands I would go and see, and, and the guitar sound was so good, I'm just going, and I was scratching my head going, I don't understand how he's getting that, you know. He, look, that, he's using pedals. That's well, look, do you know what? I think, because that, we'll definitely come back to to, to that, because clearly that's... Um, certainly shaped obviously your sure. career path and going into the gig rig and all that kind of stuff and there's obviously um, that passion for tone is, is clearly what makes TPS such you know sort of compulsive kind of viewing and being so popular mm. um, but th there's that moment I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know sort of that moment and, and perhaps how you know how it came about and how your family reacted or whatever when you just sort of went right I know, I'm sure you guys would all love me to go and be a doctor or a dentist or some other, you know, proper career, but I'm just going to do this guitar thing, uh, you know, especially if your dad was, you know, if it was a very religious sort of uh, upbringing and, you know, was was that like, did, was that like the world's, did his, you know, was he really disappointed? Was that um, tough to do? It was. So I was, I started doing gigs when I was 16 mm. and I used to take two guitar cases to school. One had my guitar in and one had all the mm -hmm. my clothes and stuff for the gig. And so I'm sleeping at a, you know, at a friend's house and we'd you know, then go off and do mm -hmm. you know, gigs in, uh, down the valley in, in Brisbane and stuff. And yeah, it was, um, it was tricky. But, you know, so, and he passed away when I was 19. Right. But I was, I'd started, um, no, so I hadn't started. It was the year after. I went to study music at the Conservatorium of Music mm -hmm. in in Queensland um, but I think yeah my parents had too much going on personally to be really bothered about what <laughs> was going on with me I, I, I ought to throw in the caveat as well I, was, I, I shouldn't 
just because you have religious parents doesn't mean that, that you know, somehow... Oh, no, it's fair. Know, and there's loads of cool... Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just meant, I, I suppose, I, I mean, was, very, was, was it a, a very strict I think it was a very personal... Of, I mean, that was... Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There's, you know, and it's more the rock thing. and roll aspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah Maybe I think it gets kicked though, back against uh, back then as well. Yeah, there was a big yeah. thing back in the 80s, Yeah, you know, yeah. with certain religious circles, yeah. that music was... Was evil. Well, not least because in the eighties everyone was drinking himself crazy. All that, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. And, mm. I, and it wasn't it, it wasn't out of a, some um, wasn't necessarily out of some sort of puritanic. Mm. Um, it was more of a you know he wanted the best for me, and but that's yeah. how he that ex, you know because yeah. he was religious that how he expressed it. Right. You know? um, but yeah. But you but you just were like determined. I've got to. I didn't really have a choice. It was never a choice. It was like this is. You mean because your brain wouldn't, uh, you know, this you, you were into it so much. Yeah, I yeah. just couldn't do anything else, mm. you know. Uh, and, and was um, the aspiration at the time to be a professional guitar player then and make it a was career? To be on it? YouTube. It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think so. I was, you know, I'd been playing, um, you know, from a very young age. And we were in a very busy band in Brisbane, and then I started touring with a girl in Australia called Max Sharam, and she was like a you know top-selling artist mm-hmm. in Australia, uh, and she was she's like a female David Bowie. She's mm-hmm. amazing, and that um, opened up my eyes to a lot of you know other elements of, of you know what was going on uh, musically. But then it was around that time that I just got fascinated with the difference of being connected and and how that comes about that's connected with your sound Mm -hmm. you know um and the difference between your experience of having a gig where you've got a a good sound and a great sound and how that's this the the arc of that is so Mm -hmm. huge um and yeah that that whole process became i I was fascinated with it i wanted Mm -hmm. to you know and i still you know i want to be as good a guitar player as I can because I want to have the technical facility to be able to, you know, if, if I feel something, mm-hmm. I want to be able to play it. Um, but definitely the feeling for me, this has to be happening mm-hmm. for that to come through. You know, I, I've said this before and Mick gets a bit embarrassed when I say this, but Mick is, Mick has the ability to get tone from basically anything. It's, it's remarkable. Um, and, you know, of course he has his, preferred things he has you know the two rock and everything mm-hmm. that we use in the studio and it just gets this cr- crazy good sound but he can basically pick up anything and sound fantastic it's all I, in the hands man. listen yeah, yeah. to the tone coming off these hands <laughs> listen a, there's, to there's it there's a challenge there but that I can't do, that's not me yeah. Yeah. I've I think got it's to be approaches. you know yeah it's different approaches because the opposite of that is you can sculpt things and get you can sound a, a, a load of different ways which I can't ever do and that is frustrating right. is re- anyway let's not get into that but uh, so, was your journey similar? I mean, uh, it, <laughs> you know, what, what, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a story that is so un rock and roll. <laughs> I'm not sure it will be good, but anyway. So I started playing really young, fourteen, um, out gigging in pubs. I remember my dad picking me up one. Uh, we had this gig in 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 Seaton in Devon, and my dad, bless him, he had this office job and he worked really hard. But he used to drive me everywhere playing gigs. He was, he really, because he supported me so much and yeah. he bought me my first strat and all that. And he just, I think he was living slightly vicariously because he <laughs> wanted to do uh, it, yeah. awesome. which I think is true of all supportive dads when they're trying to push their kids to do stuff. And he wasn't pushy, he wasn't like unpleasantly whatever. He just, he was supportive and he, he drove me everywhere. Anyway, this, I, 14 Double, years old. Doubled the audience numbers in some places, did he? <laughs> No, we had this. We had this. Oh, really? Um, that was that was my experience of gigging when if your mum no, came along, no, it would no. double we, the audience size. Back in those days, the, the the pub gig scene around the southwest was rocking. It oh, was really? packed, you know. And we play these packed pubs, these late night drinking holes at like fourteen years old. So there I am doing this gig in Seaton, a couple of pints of cider or whatever, like behind my dad's back, and then he has to drive me to Fleet Services to pick up the. Um, coach to go on the French exchange with all the kids from school so is this odd so I, I you know what, what? was in, in a van because the guys were, the other guys were a couple of years older than me and they were able to drive and stuff so we had a van and we were playing by the time I was 16 17 we were doing sometimes four or five nights a week 
and doing quite big gigs. We'd sell sell out our own gigs, and they'd be queued down the hill and all of that. And it was just cover cover stuff, but it was good, and it was and we were the you know we were the hot poop, and I thought I was good, and then, and then the world got a bit bigger, so no longer were, were we these big fish in this tiny pond. The world got a bit bigger, and I met a bunch of really cool people, including Robbie McIntosh. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend of his called Marco Rossi and a bunch of people in the Weymouth area and there was this hugely versatile music scene and there came this crashing moment when I realised how crap I was <laughs> and that it had a profound it had a profound effect on me because my dad was going great 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 the band was about to get signed to Universal um, I wasn't at part of that band at that time but we'd been through the process and there was quite a lot of big things happening and I said do you know what I'm going to university because I was so disheartened by having met all these guys that were so good and so much more musically able that I just thought I could never get there. I couldn't see a way of getting there. Okay. So, So, sorry, just to get get a positive end on that story, I then go through university, fall out of university, straight into Guitarist magazine and probably fall into the thing that I was always best at in the first place. So is it possible for you to look back at that a bit more objectively. I've known yeah. you for quite a while, a few years, worked with you in a few different capacities, and you are an irritating perfectionist. <laughs> Dan says this. You know, yes. I, I don't... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Thanks. you're so much better at everything that you do than you ever give yourself credit well, it's, for. It, yeah. you know, it's, so uh, can you look back? Is it possible yeah, for you yeah, to look oh, back, totally. back now if and I, go, if I look back now, Yeah, and I, if I could have just understood a couple different things about how to connect some things in terms of playing and music, obviously 2020 hindsight and all of that, yeah, absolutely. I would have tried harder. I would have put more effort in. I would have done so many things. Or given yourself more credit, maybe. Yeah. I mean, give, were you give actually... yourself a break. And of course, what yeah. I realise now is that Yes, while, while we all aspire to really fantastic musicians, and those guys are fantastic musicians, um, it's not all that matters. Mm. Actually, the difference, and it's a bit, I'll try and keep this brief, but on a sort of philosophical point, the difference between, for me, an artist and a musician is an artist absolutely means it from their heart and they can't not do it, and it doesn't matter how good they are, because the thing that they give is compelling Mm -hmm. because they give themselves and the reason that connects with you as an audience member is that you don't care that they can't play their hemi demi semi quavers in the phrygian mode Mm -hmm. you don't it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. um so pete's laughing because i said phrygian (laughs) (laughs) um and a musician is someone who probably aspired to that once but can do all of those other things And the connection for me is less. And I never wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be an artist. And I couldn't see a way of of getting that out because all that was coming out was Stevie Ray Vaughan (laughs) and and the other things that I was obsessed with. And so, yeah, yeah, maybe I did. I chucked the towel in a bit early. I also saw lots of my mates getting dropped from record labels and owing record companies hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that was like, yeah, I'm just not really into that. That's not my thing, you know. Not brave, I guess, is the truth. So... I like the way that we're keeping the timeline going here. I'm guessing you're both now sort of early 20s. Not obviously now now. We're yep. in, in the story. Wouldn't that but be interesting? You're, so you're still in Australia though. Mm-hmm. Um, so And living the dream, presumably. Touring, playing the guitar. Living a dream. Living a dream. <laughs> Don't know if it's the uh, dream. Just living a dream, yeah. Dreaming so while when, living. <laughs> when did it all go wrong? <laughs> 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 well, so... Uh, I had an epiphany. Um, we just finished this uh, this fantastic tour. We've been touring around with Chris Isaac, uh, supporting him around yeah. Australia and having the best time. And then we just finished that tour. I got a call from the manager the next day. He says, oh, well, Max has moved to New York. And I'm like, okay. And he said, yep, so um, take care of yourself. <laughs> that was it. You know. Brutal. <laughs> and I was like, Brutal. Oh, okay. Um, so I I got a, a gig um, playing in bands throughout uh, Asia, Singapore, and China, and and but it was a sort of it was a wake up call that 
you know, as far as I mean, there was the touring and all that sort of stuff, especially with original music, not my original music, but with, with music I was so proud to be a part of, uh, was just incredible. And then, and it's so easily taken away. Um, and it was like, okay, I need to sort something out here. I, when I got back from um, Asia, you know, I was still playing five, six nights a week uh, in Sydney. Um, Dad yeah, lived in China. Moved to Sydney. I was there for a year. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I was sort of, yeah, on and off. And, um, and I think that that was... It, that's what it was all that's, about. That's when his uh, Kung Fu LP sound yeah. effects really came in handy. Are we, are we confusing? <laughs> do they do Kung Fu in China? Or is that a Japanese thing? Chinese. No, Chinese. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Obviously, I'm being sorry massively... Yeah, sorry yeah, massively, yeah. Yeah. all of East Asia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think when I... It was around this time I got back when I started having um, the epiphanies about pedals and sound and all this sort of stuff. I started working towards something else. I wasn't exactly sure what that was, but I knew it was going to head somewhere. And met uh, a young lady at a gig who's now my wife, and she's English. See, so one of my favourite bands growing up was uh, XTC. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> there, there was my wife, and then XTC. <laughs> so, well, we were playing because uh, XTC were massive in Australia. Yeah. And we we're playing a song, and this this girl comes up and says, "Well, I know Barry Andrews, the keel player, the old mm-hmm. keel player from XTC." And one of my favourite guitar players ever uh, is uh, Dave Gregory from XTC. And now I play in a band with him because she we ended up moving back to Swindon, which is where he's from. So, so you, you, this is all in China? So, no, this happened in Sydney. Oh, so I met her in right, Sydney and right, we were together right. for a couple of years in so Sydney. What, this Martine's your wife's name. Martine, what, yep. she, what was she doing in Sydney? Just on... She was working uh, in a recruitment agency, right. um, an accounting recruitment agency. So yes, ended up back in... Um, Back in Swindon, and I engineered a meetup with Dave Gregory. I'm being called the world's most successful stalker. Um, I <laughs> so D- Dave Gregory was a big fan of Matt Schofield, and um, a friend of mine was Matt Schofield's tech uh, Simon Law. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, you know, come down. I'm pretty sure Dave's going to be here, and I'll introduce you to him. And he did, and I, and I interviewed Dave for the for the Gigri website years ago. And we've been in a band now for 10 years, working on album number three. Um, uh, do you know what? I'm going to sound awful here. What was an XTC big hit? Making plans um, for Nigel. The, yes. Um, yeah. Senses yeah. Work, uh, uh, working overtime. Making plans for Nigel. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Rock. Uh, that there's, yeah. They were. It's really funny actually when I. They were such an influential band. Uh, Andy Partridge, the songwriter, um, the, one, the main songwriter. You know, Colin Moulding, the other one. You know, the, the, I found their albums so incredibly inspiring because they are, um, they've got that, the art element through them. The, Andy, the way Andy expresses himself musically is in, it's so incredibly inspiring, but the way Dave approaches guitar on, is, is incredible. For me, he's the guitar player I always wanted to be because I think you'll never truly know what he's capable of because what he plays, and it's, you know, it's, it is phenomenal, but it's always so supportive of the song, mm-hmm. and you know, it was, so it was you know for me it was Crowded House and XTC. That mm-hmm. was like, it's all there, you know, everything I ever wanted to be. Because I took this big shift from Steve Vai. Yeah. Suddenly I'm you know I'm listening to songs, and I think it was, I heard um, Dave Gregory on a solo on a song called Real by Real. It just blew my mind. It was clean tone, you know, but it was. Um, it, but a bit punky and it, there's such attitude behind it so that was another big turning point for me um, and then yeah so ended up in ended up in Swindon and you know I was still, pl- still playing <laughs> no it's, what you, I'm not I don't even perhaps without wanting to upset any of the other residents of Swindon which seemed perfectly nice whenever I've been there but what, what, what did <laughs> nice. you what did you describe it as when I first came to see you oh no no, 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 no we don't say this on that. camera okay, we won't do that then <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think th- I, it's really interesting. This is, something happened. Something happened in. <laughs> we 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 lived in London when we first moved back to England. Yeah. With, you know, with Patine and and it was so amazing, and Swindon was was really unusual. It was um, 
you can travel for 10 minutes in any direction from Swindon and yeah. it is it, stunning. Yeah, has, uh, it also has significant geographical advantage. It's right in the middle of the bottom of England for anyone who doesn't mm. know. Yeah. Therefore, you can get anywhere pretty quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I think it, it's, it's always sport. It, it is a them. relatively typical post-war there you go. Uh, exactly. New yeah. town, isn't yeah, yeah. it? Yeah, And the industry with, there is, I mean, there is yeah. so much business there. We sometimes will mm. have to go and get something or drive somewhere, and I see yeah. a new bit of Swindon that I haven't mm. seen five years on. You yeah. Know? It's, it's, it's colossal places. A lot well, there. well avoided. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, okay, the, uh, we get, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about Mick's early years at Guitarist Magazine as well, and, and kind of. Yep. Because what did you go in as a, just a junior? Yeah, well, so the, 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 the more positive outcome of my previous tale of woe was that I sort of stumbled into university because I didn't, you know, it, those were the days when the government paid for you to go to university and I knew that I needed to get out of my hometown because yeah. I lived in a small town called Yeovil in Somerset or at least near there. And a bit like Swindon, you know, as, as good as a place it is, it, I, I wanted to leave it. Mm -hmm. I, wanted to, I wanted to go somewhere else. So going to university seemed like a good idea because all my mates were doing it. Yeovil's pretty. My aunt lives just outside Yeovil. Oh, whereabouts? I can't remember the name of the... But you go like on the Yeovil bypass, you just turn off it and go left for about a mile. Montacute. Stokes of Hamden. I think it's that one. Yeah, my mum used to live in Stokes of Hamden and on every letter I ever wrote her, I used to write Stokes of Normal. <laughs> <laughs> she used to... Anyway, <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> and she said the, the postman's getting really upset. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I went to university and... Uh, for anyone who wants a good laugh, I studied media studies. Of course you so, did. Social sciences and media, mm -hmm. and a big part of that was media studies. And um, on a slightly serious note, for anyone who doesn't think mass communications is the most important thing in the world, it is, because that's, that's how we communicate. And it was a revelatory experience, not just for the learning and the, and the but in being taught how to think a completely different way and in meeting people that I'd never met before. You know, in, in Yeovil, there were no black people. There were, it, was, it was a culturally tiny place, uh, artistically and culturally. So to get out of that and go somewhere else was, mm. a, was a... Which university did you go to? I went to London first. Mm -hmm. I went um, to the uh, university that had the worst grades <laughs> in the whole league tables, which at that time was called City Poly. Right. Oh, back in the days when we had polys. Yeah, and it yeah. became London Guildhall University. And I did a year there. It kind of didn't work out for various reasons. And I ended up in Bath, which is also a very kind of nice middle class Beautiful place. Beautiful place. Beautiful Anyway, place. anyway, but it, instead of, it, you know, for all those people who say, oh, you shouldn't go to university unless you're going to do medicine or accountancy or law or something, cobblers, because yeah, absolutely. you learn how to be a, a human being mm -hmm. when, you, when you spend time learning about stuff. Anyway. And you have to live off... 2p yeah it yeah, taught yeah. me how to think very differently and and completely by luck i was about to graduate i went to work as a temp in barclays bank to earn some money i'd worked at gap throughout my university to help pay the most the manager stop room there you should see the way he folds jeans <laughs> honestly <laughs> yeah it's unreal I, I can imagine he's a perfectionist trained jean folder <laughs> yeah yeah I do, I do i'm a bit funny about packing um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, anyway sorry I'll keep this story short and I'm thinking what the hell am I going to do in my life you know because I'd, I'd applied to every graduate job going of course they don't look at people like me who haven't been to the right school and the mm -hmm. right university so trying to get into somewhere like Pricewaterhouse or any of the big graduate employers forget it and it, I didn't understand that at that time so I'm feeling very dejected very kind of oh god what the hell am I going to do in my life because I literally had no idea and I think I picked up my copy of Guitarist magazine, to which I was a subscriber, and it said, we're moving, or we have moved. And they moved from Cambridgeshire, yes. which is 200 e miles Ely. away, Eli, Ely? Yeah, to Bath. So I went and knocked on the door and said, have you got any jobs? Mm. And they said, well, that's not really how it works, mate. I said, why not? <laughs> and I got, I got to chat with somebody, and it just so happens they were recruiting some people, and completely by chance, totally by chance, he says to me, what, what guitar magazine do you like? And I said, I really love Guitarist magazine. And he, he like, he stepped back and he was like, what? How old are you? I said, 22 or whatever I was, 21. He said, why don't you like Total Guitar magazine? I said, because it's rubbish. <laughs> he said, what do you mean it's rubbish? I said, well, it's just, it's written by kids for kids and all the information in it's wrong and um, the tab's often wrong and the gear reviews don't, they obviously don't know anything about gear. Um, 
and he's like, I, I just can't believe this because at the time, Total Guitar Magazine was their guitar magazine, yeah. and it was outselling guitar as two to two one. Two to one, yeah. So he said, you need to write me something about this because I'm not sure I believe you. But is it, this is is this Neville or are you? No, no, no. This, this is right, this, this is, is one senior of the, one of the publishers. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. This is one of the guy who's doing the recruitment, mm -hmm. and he's like, I don't think I, I, this doesn't make any sense to me. So anyway, I did the thing, get recruited. We go into this group recruitment scheme where we get put around various magazines because you're supposed to learn how to make magazines, mm -hmm. right? And they didn't want to put me on Guitarist Magazine because I knew too much about guitars. Right. They wanted to put really? me on a magazine that I didn't know anything about so I could be objective in running a magazine. Oh, right. So you yeah. were going in fairly... They wanted, they wanted production people who right. could run Right, so you weren't just magazines. going in as a staff writer then? Or nope. Like that. They right. wanted production okay. people who could run magazines because they had a big problem with that efficiently, effectively, on budget, well planned, all of that stuff. And anyway, two of my weeks were on guitarist and Nev, bless him, I don't know if you watch this, uh, Nev was my boss for many years. He said, he's not going anywhere. He is staying on this magazine and there is no way. And they tried to get me off. They were trying to get me off and put me on another mag. Knitting weekly or what yeah, the other? whatever. Cross stitch and monthly. I later learned that Nev had actually, <laughs> Nev had gone out on quite a limb to keep me on oh. guitarist and then the irony that, so then many years later i end up as editor-in-chief of guitarist total guitar um guitar techniques and all of futures guitar magazines so um see so kids yeah and total guitar magazine isn't rubbish it just wasn't for me <laughs> it's it's funny because uh, as, an, as an aside there i actually still felt that that the guitarist magazine i often used to find was was uh quite inaccessible yeah and was talking about I wasn't, I used to read issues of Guitarist magazine and go, I don't really want to have a six page review on some guitar I've never heard of built by some amazing luthier out in the back and beyond. What I really wanted is, is a quick interview with uh, the bloke from the Foo Fighters. And that's why it just outsold Guitarist two to yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> just to sort of, you know, what, what pedals is the bloke from the Foo Fighters and a bit of a tab at the end of and it. And was, it was right yeah. on that cusp of the um, like early to mid 90s mm. where Oasis blew up and Britpop blew up. Mm. And, it, you know, Total Guitar was a big part of mm. re guitarizing. It's youth it, culture in Great what? Britain. It did a fantastic it's, job. It, it's this nicely kind of wraps into that whole, you know, b b the back end of the nineties. Sorry, back end of the eighties. Sorry, mm. I just think the guitar. Uh, every guitar hero was so unbelievably stupidly good. Whether yeah. it was Steve Vai at yeah, one yeah. end to Mark yeah. Knopfler at another, or, you know, yeah. you couldn't listen to a piece of guitar music without going, "How on earth does that get played?" Yeah. You know, I got to, I got to, I got to do this tape. You yeah. know, so no, no fancy mm. editing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But and then I do remember when when a uh, whole mix of whether it was you know Nirvana or Blur or Oasis, you know, all of a sudden this massive and that's that artist versus musician thing. The artist yeah, kind of yeah. came back. Didn't it was they? the anti culture and just went boom. Yeah, and it had crappy happened. guitar sound, three guitar chords, loads of songs, and every just Yay. almost exactly the same as when the Beatles hit yes. America in 1964. Every kid in the country went. I need to play the guitar. Mm. Mm. You know, they, they watch Nirvana or they watch yeah. later Oasis and they go, I need to play the guitar. And, TG and the walls of this store still reverberate with the sound of Wonderwall. <laughs> no matter how hard we try and scrub it out. <laughs> it's just like so it's 10, not smoke on the water 10 anymore. million renditions of Wonderwall from 1990 or whatever it was that we can never I bet they all play it in E as well, don't they? Is it not in E? <laughs> so there we are. There we are. Dan and I went to uh, Japan a couple of weeks ago with Boss. Short story. We end up in this bar and it's like, oh, yes, maybe I've two, about maybe this. three a.m. There's guitars hanging on the wall all around. Dan goes, let's do a gig. <laughs> so we pick up these guitars and we start playing. This guy, oh, do you remember the Kung Fu dude who came in? Who was like, he was <laughs> oh, honestly, he was like, oh, like I've got the footage on my, I've got the footage on left hand. Phone. And, and then, then you, you go, go whoosh, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, Amazing. anyway, so Dan starts playing Wonderwall. I start playing here. Oh, because Noel plays it capo two. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I'm going. I can't trans. You know, I've been playing the guitar for thirty years. I cannot transpose from E minor to F no. sharp minor. So uh, anyway, oh, fair enough. Bit of an aside. So what, what you can say to your Wonderwall people now is you're F playing it wrong. No F one's played Wonderwall in F years. F sharp in minor. Um, so look. Uh, is that, uh, that's kind of when I first met Mick was, was when he was editor of Guitarist Magazine. Always got on well with Mick. But Dan, I've sort of met more recently. So let's fill in the gaps. You know, let's talk about Gig Rig. Because mm. it's, um, 
you know, I don't want to blow smoke up your own ass or anything like that. But but I kind of, I don't think I ever really understood five or six years ago when I first kind of heard of it. I just, I was just like, this is some niche weird thing that's, I don't even know how you're making a living out of it, let alone, <laughs> you know, the success that it's clearly had for you. And now it, it's just, it's mental, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it's just so popular. But, to, so, but, but what's super interesting with Gig Rig is you don't make anything that makes a noise as such, do you? <laughs> you know, I was so um, enamoured with old analogue vintage pedals for such a long time. And then when I first started, you know, there are problems when you... I'll, I'll step back a bit. I had my GPA. Yeah, let's, right? let's, let's do that generally. Right? And, and, I was, and, I was, and I was always pushing state-of-the-art because in my head it had to be mm -hmm. the best. One thing about state-of-the-art afforded me was when I was doing all this touring was that I could set up a sound, press one button, and the sound would appear. Yeah. I discovered pedals, the old analog stuff. You know, the first, the day after I heard that Electric Mistress, I went down to, I think it was Guitar Crazy and Coogee, and I bought a CE1, mm -hmm. a Phase 90, Electric Mistress, um, and an order this, this fuzz. Oh, and a, and a, a Tube Screamer. Um, which I sold later because I didn't understand it. Uh, but, and I'm playing these pedals in, I think, oh, this is absolutely amazing, lovely sounds. But when I plugged them all in together, there was a difference, fundamental difference in what was reaching the amplifier. I thought, well, this, this is What's not the amp right. out of interest? Sorry? What was the amp out of interest? Uh, back then, the amp would have been a 19... It was a JMP50, Marshall JMP50, mm -hmm. the last of the Marshall non-master volume amplifiers. Um, and it was a sub, also a Sovtech MiG50 Wow, as well. I don't know that one, but uh, okay. So. Pretty loud. Uh, so it was, well, it was, it was headroom. It was right. loud then. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It's, it's, Max used to love loud guitar. And in the guitar solo, you know, if you're doing these big gigs and... And the guitar style, she'd run up and she'd shove her vocal mic into the guitar amplifier, you know, <laughs> much to the disdain of the sound guy, but she just loved it. Um, so, yeah, we were able to play with quite, you know, quite a lot of volume. So, yeah, th I, there was, I, I could hear this difference when I had all the pedals plugged in together. But there's also this thing, that, which I just couldn't, especially doing these big gigs and having to have my sounds, you know, and, and quite... Uh, involved sounds and having to switch quickly mm -hmm. between them and a friend of mine was teching for uh, a guitar player called Mark Lazotte more better, well, known as Diesel in Australia mm -hmm. and he had a Pete Cornish rig and the the they couldn't work out how to MIDI map stuff. And because I'd had a lot of experience doing rack, they asked me to come and help them um, map some MIDI mm -hmm. stuff some, um, for, some, for some reverbs. And I saw this thing and it just blew my mind, you know, and it, the, the pedal board was, you know, basically the size of this rug here. And it had molded <laughs> a molded um, area for his round base um, mic stand and, you know, everything was sort of manufactured around you know yes. the foot switches and, and this cable that went back to the racks like that held all the pedals. It was it, honestly, it it took it, you know three guys to move this thing around and set it up. Sonically, unbelievable. It was just biblical. Um, and I'm like, okay, well this is so he's doing it. He's managing to switch press on one button. He's turning on his fuzz face and he's turning on at the same time that rack delay mm -hmm. and other stuff. But it was the price of a house in Australia, oh. you know, mm. literally, you know. And you had to be, you, oh. you, you couldn't just go to your local music store. Or something, no, you know. absolutely. It was all, everything was custom made for each individual artist. Wasn't yeah. It? And the, and the producer I was working with at the time and I'm, I'm there going, oh, I really want to be able to do this, but you know, nothing exists. And he says to me, um, he said, build it yourself. And I just went, okay. And that was it. And I started studying um, electronics and because I had a real clear vision of what I wanted this thing to do. And working on that in Australia for a couple of years um, and then came over here and 
you know, and I was still working on it and then, you know, started off by building, you know, I built a phase 45 and, you know, just you know, gradually pushing it that way. And then I met my and now business partner, Dave Mapperson, who's um, an amazing engineer. I've spoken to a lot of engineers about this, but no one really understood the concept. But Dave also played a little, little bit of guitar. So we had this sort of crossover language where we both could, you know, mm -hmm. I could talk the electronics and he could, you know, but he understood the guitar. And the first product came out. I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. We, we released this thing called the Pro 14. It was white. It was massive. But you could plug 10 pedals into it, which is the amount of pedals that I wanted to be able to switch. But most importantly for me, one of the things about especially the vintage pedals was the, the difficulty in controlling volume of them. Old phases, um, tremolos have a, um, a psychoacoustic perceived volume drop. You know, my flanger, the electric mistress, every time you turn it on, it sounds incredible, but it drops 10% in volume. And if you're playing in the band and you've got a really good mix and you turn it on, it's just enough to pull you out of the mix. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a mod, a, a mod a friend of mine had done, had put a little, just a really simple little op amp, um, like amplifier in, the, in his electric mistress and to sort of turn the volume back up. And I went, I want to be able to do that. You know, we're going to put, put one of these, but programmable. Mm -hmm. In, in the Pro 14. So even the very first one we had, you had the ability per preset to adjust the volume. Um, and it was really funny. I was working uh, at an agency at the time, booking bands into walkabout hotels and you know, mm -hmm. the Australian theme pubs mm -hmm. around, around London and stuff. And I remember um, presenting it at the first London, uh, the first guitar show uh, that, and that was when you were working at Guitar Buyer magazine. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, and I'd done the sums. I said, if we sell a hundred of these over this weekend, I'm going to quit my job. And, you know, I'm going to, I'll be able to do this full time, you know. And we'd worked so hard to get everything ready and, and we're so excited. And then um, the day before the show opened to the public, when I think all the artists were able to walk around and we had all these people walking around going, oh, it's amazing because I had my CE1 and all my vintage mm -hmm. pedals and I'm hitting one thing, I'm going, and, and during the show, when there were thousands of people, we were so busy and it was always five people deep looking at this thing and I'm going through this and showing them how to switch all the you know, multiple um, combinations of all these pedals and it was amazing. And at the end of the show, guess how many we'd sold? Oh, I just want, it's like two or something, isn't it? We'd just sold like, one mm. and he pulled out as well <laughs> before. I, I, I honestly, this is, this is the music industry, the land of broken dreams, isn't it? The number of times that, you know, I've done an event and you have expectations yeah, here yeah. and, and, it, and, and you don't just nearly get there. Yeah. <laughs> you, just like, it, it's like, yeah. you just don't even, how do you make a million in the guitar business? <laughs> Start with two. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, but the thing for us is people were fascinated by it, but it was a new concept and we were mm. having to educate a whole yeah. market. It wasn't like we'd produce an overdrive pedal and people mm. intrinsically knew what it was just by looking at it, you know. I mean, looking back though, presumably it was just like a lot of early uh, new products. I'm guessing the form was too oh, big. Oh, it's crazy. The price it was, was stupid. Wrong. It was all, white. You know, it, was, it, it looked yeah. like something from a Star Wars set. Yeah, it did. You know? And so it's a good, it's fundamentally a good idea, but just not executed in a way that connected. With absolutely. The and I think, and it was, we'd had that out for like nine years before the release of G2, but we were very fortunate in, there are a couple of guys who really got it, like um, uh, Paul Turner um, and... Jamiroquai bassist. The, for, yeah, Jamiroquai, uh, Paul Turner and Rob, uh, the guitar player. Harris. Rob Harris from Jamiroquai. They both saw it and just went, oh, this looks mm -hmm. really cool. And a, a gentleman who's become a very dear friend of mine, Mark Johns, who was playing for Ray Davis, uh, Davis mm -hmm. at the time, uh, he was our very first ever customer and he saw it and loved it and used mm -hmm. it for his entire period of time with Ray Davis. And so little by little, people started mm -hmm. to get the concept. Was uh, it terribly expensive, that initial prototype? Uh, it was... 700 quid I think oh, okay. it was so it wasn't, so it wasn't when, crazy no. considering for, so, for what so it was did. probably more the form that was perhaps well it was it was the fact that you 
you looked at it and you didn't really understand what it was about, mm. you know. And it was, and that's when I started to get into videos. Mm. Uh, I, I thought, I, I've got to find a way. I can't just write stuff and expect people mm. to read it. I've got to find a way of getting this through. And that's when I started doing my first ever videos. Um, but then, uh, sorry, so another guitar player who's also a very dear friend of mine, um, wonderful producer, Paul Stacey. Mm-hmm. And I ended up building the rig for him when he was touring with the Finn Brothers. And that's when I got, got to meet Neil and, mm-hmm. you know, big day um, and I saw it on stage at the Albert Hall with Neil Finn you know, and Paul playing guitar and and he was bless him Paul you know he's such an astonishing musician and he was very critical of, of certain things you know right. which was ended up being amazing it was so helpful and you know and, all, but, and so what happened was in that nine years of having this you know out there all of that when all that experience went into mm. his, what is now G2. Um, and then when that came out, it was sort of, it's, that was the big turning point mm. for us as a business. And we've suddenly... Well, I mean, it's just, a, it's, I think it's, you know, it's always inspiring to hear from any sort of entrepreneur that's taken a punt on something. But I, I guess going back at that, yeah, you know, it, turning up at a guitar show, you'd probably invested hundreds of hours, thousands of pounds into getting there. You know, it's expensive to uh, exhibit there. It's heartbreaking when that initially doesn't go as well. But you obviously persevered um, and, you know, you're reaping the rewards of it now. And, and, and so you should. But it, what else do you think, you know, do, do you feel that something, there's been a fundamental shift in the sort of guitar playing... Uh, I can, I can see why digital products mm-hmm. from the 80s and 90s, people turn their back on that. You know, yep. I, mean, I, I remember, I do remember in a sales capacity here, just every year products became more and more sold on the features of them. Yes. Yep. It's, it's got more effects. Yes, yes. More memories, yep. more patches, mm-hmm. more stuff. Remember the Digitech 2112? Yeah, was and the ART, whatever yeah. it was. Maybe it was the ART 21, but whatever. When they went to two units. Two units, and yeah. And, and, oh, wow, well, yeah. And it was like, oh, wow, twice as powerful, blah, blah, blah. And the elephant in the room was, I suppose, and still sounds pretty terrible. And that was, was exactly um, where I was. Yeah. I was so caught up in that state of the art must sound yeah. better. But the, so anyway, so then of course pedals have a huge resurgence, yep. Yep. and then of course gig rig, I suppose, and you know, and, and gig rig inspired other uh, better known brands to sort of you know go. Oh, the switching market mm-hmm. seems to be a thing to be in now. So you know, da da da. Every Coke needs a um, Pepsi. Yeah, um, and and actually that's, 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 that you, is a serious comment because you know. Uh, rising it tide lifts all ships. Absolutely, yeah. you know, yeah, boss, yeah. boss doing ES8 yeah, yeah. or ES5 yeah. well, validates. The funny rig, story about that mm. is that that was basically the start of of. Um, okay, but long story short, Mick War had just finished working at the Guitarist Magazine. Mm-hmm. I was over in at Nam. And Mick was saying, I'm thinking about coming over, but I don't have anywhere to stay. I said, well, come and stay with me. I've got you know, a big I've left room. my job. You're I'm left- totally mm-hmm. broke. Yeah. But Can he- I share your hotel room was actually yeah. the, the question. That yeah. Was- <laughs> and he said, yeah, so by all means. And, and because I've been talking to Mick about, you know, how, how's it possible that I can... How did you meet them? Because we're not even well, really... Well, what well, the first, the Pro 14, when mm-hmm. it was when I got it reviewed, because I'd been reading uh-huh. Guitar Buy magazine. Dan walks into Guitar Buy and, and says, look at this. Look at this. And it was... And, it and was I'm like, like, I didn't think Guitar Buy was a future title. No, it wasn't. So I left. left Future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gone yeah. to Guitar Buyer. And then what? Then back to Back future to Guitarist, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. So that's the... The goal was always editor of Guitarist. Right, and right, I had right. to... Oh, go away so to you had back, an opportunity basically. to be an editor of Guitar Buyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. So and, sorry, so you and, met... And, and yeah, so I met Mick there and he said, oh, you're really into vintage pedals. And I said, yes. And he said, oh, do you fancy writing a column for the magazine? Um, which I did. I wrote that. I wrote um, a column called Porn Stars, mm-hmm. um, basically right up till the magazine folded. Um, uh, long after I left, by the way. Long after, long after <laughs> I left. <laughs> um, just, just to make that clear. <laughs> but Mick had got me doing some interviews. He got me, uh, you know, he knew I was a massive police fan, and Mick got me to interview Andy Summers and, and when he's over at Guitarist Magazine. Mm-hmm. So, and we'd been, you know, we'd stayed friends, and Mick had borrowed, you know, some gear for mm-hmm. to do stuff for the show for Guitarist Magazine. And 
Mick was one of the first per- people I spoke to about when G2 was coming out. So I went and saw him and said, look, we're doing this. What do you think? And, you know, he was really helpful. And so he's always been... <laughs> what Dan means is I barely understood it. Because <laughs> <laughs> one interesting thing about G2 and about the gig rig in general is you can read all the stuff that you want to read. You can go on the website. You can do all of that. You can watch all the demos. But until you actually sit and use it and hear it, it doesn't make any sense. And at that point, the penny drops. And mm. it took me to that point, which you're probably getting to. Well, yeah, so to talk about the, the, what happened with the ES8, so when Mick was over, we'd been already talking about ways that you know, Mick could help me, you know, because I was a guitar player, and I, and, and I had this vision for this product that I knew would help, but as far as marketing and all this sort of stuff, I had zero idea. Um, whereas Mick had a, an incredible understanding of, of the guitar market and you know and, and guitar players and and as a someone to talk to about this stuff to help gain an understanding. Mick mm-hmm. was my guy, and so we and I talk- started making video. That's and he what- started doing video. And Mick started showing me these videos. Now the videos I had done up to that point were atrocious, horrific. <laughs> that you know, I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know. I'd go down to like we a camera all, store. Every first video we made mm-hmm. was all atrocious. Your That's first video wasn't atrocious. Your, <laughs> you know, it never went out, mate. No. <laughs> but so Mick's showing me these videos, and I'm going, and they just mm. they look like cinema, and I'm and I thought, well, I can never afford to pay to you know. It was just it looked so amazing. It sounded brilliant. Yeah. I'm mixing audio from the, the, my little handy cam thinking that, you know, I so literally zero idea of what I was doing with that. So Mick was going to help me out with that. And we'd sit down to talk about marketing concepts, right? We'd say, okay, look, we've got half an hour. Mm-hmm. Fast oh, forward but, to now. But, yeah. but, but oh, before we do, have you seen this? Oh, yes, yeah, the new pedal. Oh, it's amazing. And whenever we sat down to talk about, um, uh, you know, stuff for gig rig, we just ended up talking about gear. And it was... You know, which is what we both love to do. We're both, you know, so enthralled in it. Anyway, we were at NAM, and while Mick was Mick was sharing the room with me, that was when the day the ES8 was launched. I was basically whoring myself around trying to get work. That's yeah. why. That's why I was at NAM, and Lee bless you, gave me some work when I left Guitarist magazine. So, uh, I, I think Mick's again being extremely, I chased him down <laughs> is the truth. Well, however it, however it work. worked out, it worked but out yes, well. And, and it I'm kept, very grateful. It kept me and uh, my wife alive. So Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, wow, I, mean, I, was, I was really surprised that Boss had you know, released mm. something like that. And then Mick says, well, look, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships, and I thought I've never thought about it like that, and it was like mm. amazing. And yeah, then, you you were then, it knocked you. It was mm. like it was it like was being the, in a car accident. You were you were just knocked off kilter, and you were you were like, this is bad. Mm. Yeah, I didn't because it, that had been up to that point. You know, everything I had done over the past you know decade and a half was has was materialised in this mm. unit. You know, mm. and. And Mick helped me see it in a different way. And in fact, um, you know, actually we were just in Tokyo hanging out with Boss and the guys are great. And Yoshi <laughs> is a, an absolute superstar. And, you know, and they're as passionate about the stuff as we do. We, uh, we approach it slightly differently as in this is the switching stuff is all we do. And, um, you know, things like, um, you know, the built-in amplifiers, mm. you know, and stuff within G2 and the isolated output. So there's, you know, a bunch of different stuff. And, but he, yeah, so he helped me see it in a different way. But even then, when I'm going, okay, we've really got to sit down and discuss the ways that we can we can help the business, you know? Okay, but this has just been released at NAM. Oh yeah, man, this is awesome! And after and after days and days of trying to to talk about ways, yeah. uh, Mick just says, "Why don't we just do this? Why don't we just talk about gear?" Mm. And yeah, that's so much. You know, it it just. Because we're both so passionate about it, and as opposed to trying to, um, you know, as, as far as, you know, you look at that point in time, Mick had been so busy with with guitar medicine. I rarely saw him, and and I knew whatever he's going to go into next, he, you know, because Mick puts himself into everything mm-hmm. 100%. I thought if we can do some videos just together, just talking about gear, mm-hmm. 
it will just be at the very least it's going to be so much fun and and that was it that was it we sat in the corner of a room it's, well I, fair play to you guys because one of the reasons I, I left Guitarist was because I was watching print media get less and less and less mm. relevant. And we, we put a lot of effort into trying to make video and the company wasn't really interested in video. And so while that's all happening, I'm watching you and Rob and Andy Pro Guitar Shop, um, mm. Gear Man Dude. Mm. Um, I'm watching all these, all you lot go be absolutely 100% relevant to what people wanted at that time. Well, we're there spending God knows how much money trying to get this magazine out that nobody wants anymore. Mm. Here's some guys just talking together on, on YouTube, having a laugh, yeah. hanging out like two friends would be chatting down the pub. So it yeah. wasn't an original idea when we said, why don't we hang around and, and sit on YouTube and metals. talk about it? You know, we were directly essentially copying what you were doing and what um, other other people yeah. were doing on, online. So it was you just can see the, jumping on. You can see the, the, the thread through I think all or most of the, the successful the YouTube channels that seem to have struck a chord and, and engaged fundamentally it is not about production quality or mm. it, it is about it's a nice it, is a, it is about um, the realness of it yep. you know people two people who really love the stuff yeah. and obviously know a bit about it as well which obviously helps and enjoy each other's company so you get a bit of you know it feels very natural and comfortable to yeah, watch yeah. Um, well I think right across all forms of media there was a kind of a coming together of producers mm. and an audience where you know it, we used to get criticized at guitarists for being in our ivory towers and talking down to mm. people it's absolutely true we totally did because we mm. thought we were experts and actually what dawned on on me very quickly as the internet came came around was you know there's some guy in bumhole Idaho who who knows more about Telecaster bridge pickups than anybody else on the planet. Yeah. And he's got 5,000 pages on a website about mm. Telecaster bridge pickups. So there's nothing that I can ever write about Tele bridge pickups in Guitarist magazine that is any more definitive than that. Mm. At that point, I lost instant interest in writing articles about things because there's no way I can top that guy. I'd much rather take a step closer to the, to the people who we are really, which is enthusiasts, mm -hmm. and go, do you know what? let's do this together because we've got a certain small amount of knowledge mm. and we can help share that with people who aren't there yet and then we can bring in other people who've got more knowledge than us to enlighten us all and that was it is so liberating to be able to do that mm. and not have to commit it to 50,000 print magazines where you know the thing you've got wrong will be in wrong in print for the next 25 years yeah. <laughs> i can imagine i bet i bet if i asked you you could probably tell me every single page of every single guitarist magazine ever with a spelling mistake on it couldn't you not quite but my, <laughs> my favorite my there's two of my favorite ones one was we used to do this column called um classic track and it was uh it was a transcription of a classic track and it was radio head time dry and uh i remember writing the strap line and it was um because i was a sub-editor at this point uh, this month, Simon Young dissects Radiohead's classic High and Dry, and please write this strap line up because Simon always writes them too bloody short. <laughs> and that gets that goes out in the magazine. <laughs> and I didn't say bloody either. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Which one's that? That's got to be around somewhere, isn't it? Uh, probably. Yeah, I'll try oh, and find come it. Come on, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And there were there were numerous examples of that, you know. And then from you know, if you work for a proper newspaper, that's never allowed. You always have to put in. X's or, or Greek type yeah. or something, but um, oh yeah, it was loads of that stuff, loads of that stuff. Well, clangers. I mean, so we kind of got round to today uh, where, you know, the two of you have been doing that pedal show together successfully oh, yeah. now for, what are you, two years in, three years in? It's got to be nearly three, isn't it? Nearly three, three years in. Yeah, yeah nearly three. Uh, Gig Rig is doing better than ever. You've done a collaborative uh, pedal design with with Keeley and you know DNM drivers and excited DNM as a as an entity is an interesting thing that who knows where it might go. Um, so I guess that you know that's kind of exciting and and everybody can go and subscribe to that channel and find out more. Like, should we just sort of uh, should we just sort of a finish off with a um, I don't know just like you you know where you are now. How has that changed, you know, have you changed your feeling about the kind of gear that you want to own? Are you, are you happy with the gear that you physically own now? Do you ever see yourself reaching a point where you go, 
I've got it all. I've done it. Just. It's t- yeah. Is okay. That the new, is that it? I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this in two parts. One is, for me anyway, it is utterly dispiriting the gear journey because I've just come to the conclusion that the only stuff I want is utterly unattainable to me. In what sense? Financially un- unattainable. Yeah. I want a vintage strap. Why? Because they're awesome. So I'm on this quest to find one of these. And I'm, the reason I'm playing so many straps at the moment is because I do, I do actually think that the modern Fender Custom Shop, are, I, they are actually better than any guitar spender's ever made in history. I genuinely believe that in terms of the tolerances and the way they're made mm. and the materials they're using and stuff. Um, so with the old ones out of, the, out of the question, and even if you do own an old one, you can't take it anywhere because of insurance. Um, you're constantly worried about it. So these things seem like the, the perfect thing to me. Um, and all those things about, we go through these, we still go through these epiphanies. So recently we had two vintage high watts. Oh, In fact, it's today's word. video. And, and you hear this thing and you go, they were right. I got really depressed after doing that video because I think, wow, if I had have just, it's so many times in guitar stores, I'd walked past 100 watt high watts, cheap. Mm. (laughs) And I just think if I had just stopped for five minutes and plugged the thing in, my whole life could be different. So the the downside of this is that just in the way that those old vintage guitars are not practically usable anymore, unless you're brave and rich, neither is that old 100 watt amp practically usable anymore. And we are in this age of there's these two schools of thought. One is me and Dan where we say, we're just not going to sacrifice anything mm-hmm. ever for guitar tone. And then we go and do a clinic in London and it's that pedal show clinic. The sound guy's like, nah, that's way too loud, mate. And Dan's like having a nervous breakdown going, well, I actually can't hear it. Well, you need to get some in-ears and come off the desk. And, and at that point, it's like, that's, that's too We've f- got hundreds of people. That's too far who, the other way. You know, who sat there waiting for us and I'm going, I literally... I'm playing from memory, not hearing a note. And that's too and far the other way. Yeah, yeah. Right, because there's no rock, there's no rock and roll in that. That's, yeah. not a, that's not an interesting experience for the audience. All that is is trying to sound like a record. And I, to, to be serious for one second, I do think that that whole silent stage thing is the death of rock and roll. I think it's nailing, yeah. nailing nails in the coffin of rock and roll. It's making it a heritage pursuit, which is fine because music needs to go on. But I don't, I'm not interested in, in that. I'm interested in rock and roll so I, I I think we've got all these people over here going digital's great and it's really brilliant and then we've got Dan and I going no it's not it's totally rubbish <laughs> C- clearly neither one of those points is probably right so uh, so to, to actually answer your question what's the goal are you happy with your gear I am but I, I think there is this there's this future for all of us which incorporates modern technology and it sounds good too Sorry, yeah. I've, I've totally, and what, and totally hogged that answer. No, 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 no I, mean, it, 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 I mean, it's the fact that the, the chemistry between you two so good. Is it because you share much the same view or? or? We've, we've had so much of the experience now being in the room and being mm. affected by what's coming out of the amplifiers. You know, we, we did an episode where we're looking at um, vintage Vincent Echo Rex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It I'm was, laughing because they just mm. don't exist, do they? I mean, mm. and but then the sounds were—I mean, it was noisy, and, and you hear this, rook, 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 you know, and it's like, and then the sound that was coming out, and yeah, we're just laughing, going, "This is so amazing!" Yeah, and we've had so many of these moments on the mm. show. Going back from that now is just is not yeah. a possibility. Um, you know, I've. I'm at that point now where, you know, I've done the, you know, I've done 2,000 gigs on this guitar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of them have been really good. A lot of them have been shocking. But I'm at that point now where, okay, I'm not playing five nights a week anymore. You know, we might do, you know, a gig a month. Every gig I play now has to, you know, has to matter. As far as I'm not mm-hmm. just going to turn up. I haven't got it. much time left. <laughs> Let me just get this Hotel California out once more. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like I've got this, there's a finite number of gigs I'm going to do now. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that every single one mm. of them, I'm you know my sound is going to, I'm, I'm going to be connected with that. 
And, you know, we've got to find a way to make that work mm. within a context that works with an audience. Um, so, you know, we've been so fortunate to have, uh, you know, met people like uh, Analog Man and um, you know, um, Robert Keeley and all these, all these people who are absolutely at the pinnacle of their game and creating some stellar gear that, you know, it, when you, if that's the sort of thing that you connect with, you can absolutely mm. make glorious sounds with. Mm. And so we're in that position where, um, you know, we can, you know, through this stuff, express something. Um, but yeah, so the, the, back to what Mick said, it's just now working out a way to do that. Mm. That's that's do, do you think, crazy. Do you think you guys are trying to? Do you think you guys are trying to sort of convince digital people that they're wrong? Not no. at all. Not at no. all. Because I don't. I. I, I because that would be an accusation that would get thrown at you, I guess, isn't yeah. it? Well, that when, you, when like... you express a preference for something, mm. what you're immediately saying is that I don't like this other thing. So if you support mm. football team A, mm. football team B supporter thinks you're wrong because he likes this other thing, right? And so there's no, there's no wrong. One of the things we always say on the show is there are no answers, only better questions. Mm -hmm. So anyone that's saying, is digital better than analogue, that that's the it's wrong question. question. The right question is, what's the appropriate outlet mm. for this and so what I would say to anyone who is digital native who has never experienced that visceral analog tube amp experience is at least try it because I think what a lot of people say to Dan and I is well you know you don't give this stuff a chance it's like well don't forget that for 20 years I engaged critically with every single new product mm. that came out pretty much and every year line six said to me this year it really does sound like valves <laughs> Yeah, they, every they, single year, right? So I, so last year at NAMM, for just for a joke, I said, but that's what you said last year, and twenty years ago. Yeah. So is it when? When is it actually going to sound like valves? And I think we're. I, I mm. honestly think we're all moving on a bit, and we're going. Do you know what the purpose isn't? The purpose isn't really and, to and sound like valves well, anymore. And contextually, sometimes it does. You know, it, you tell me how many songs that you're listening to on albums that have been produced in the last five years, you tell me which ones are the valve amplifiers and which ones are the digital. And that and is that you the just, exact... You couldn't do it. That is the exact you point. So couldn't do what it. Dan was saying earlier about being in the room and that visceral experience, mm. I need that yeah. to mm. feel happy and creative. Yep. And I know that I play better mm. and I feel better and it may well be completely in my brain, but I know I feel better, I play better, I feel more creative and I come up with better mm. art to sound really, mm. really yeah, dodgy yeah. about it. Um, in that environment. However, when it comes to, I don't know, recording certain live situations, mm. you know, at that point, that's where technology enables you to to mm. do a job. It, yeah. There's a function at that point. Yeah. So I think there's a split between creativity and functionality mm. and everyone sits in a different place um, on it. So I, I, all I would say to digital natives is try it and experience it because then you really know. One thing that, that, that I sort of put my head in my hands in is when I read a comment somewhere that says, oh yeah, I don't like high watts. I've got one modeled in my Kemper and it sounds rubbish. <laughs> it's like, well, you've never heard a high watt because yeah, a high yeah. watt punches you in the gut and in the chest mm. and makes you feel slightly sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that doesn't sound like a very nice experience, yeah. Yeah. but it's part of the visceral the other, physical the, experience. The other side of that as well. Um, for me, I'm really into the concept of it, something being touched by the hand of the artist. I mean, you go to the Louvre mm -hmm. and you're, the, the, Louvre. The, the Louvre. Oh, right. He said, I, I, in his very, Sorry. if you didn't, because, you know, Dan's accent spoke like, I, I, I suddenly, I, yeah, I heard. Did you? I was touched by the hand, hand of the an artist. artist in a loo. You go to the loo. And, 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 I, and, and I, was, I was like, fine. You're going to those kind of toilets, are you? Well, good for you. I could see uh, it now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, Sorry. You need to be touched by. No, no, the, you no, want no. to be touched no, no, by the so, hand no. metaphysically, so, I, I'm the idea. So if you're at the Louvre, okay, which is an art gallery, it's an art in gallery Paris. in Paris, and the queue to see the Mona Lisa, which is this, you know, mm -hmm. and then you go outside, and then there's a poster of the Mona Lisa. It looks exactly the same, mm. but there's this thing about, you know, the romantic notion of, you know, that's the thing that's touched by the, the hand of the artist. My 1961 AC30. I plug into that thing and there's, I have this reverence for the Samplify because it's, this was, you know, 
61. This is when it was all happening. And I turned that thing up, and that's the sound. Yeah, yeah. Now, there are lots of other things that say, well, we can sound just like that. It's like, no, but that's, that's the sound. I've already got it. Mm. I'm not interested in something that might sound like it. The, the, you know, the guys who are making the amplifiers that change the world made this one. And, and whether that's just a psychological thing, even if it is a psychological thing, it's that's enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's enough for me. Uh, for anyone commenting now, the, the Mona Lisa is a fake. You're slightly missing the point. <laughs> yeah, well, look. We could make this video three yeah, hours yeah, long yeah, 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 and yeah, still be no nearer sure. to anything other than it all boils down to what your personal... Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. I just, I just to say one thing to finish. Yes. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to you. All these videos that you do and, you, and you, you're talking with the other people and that, um, I just want to let everyone know in the, in the early days of us doing our thing, Lee contacted us and just said, guys, I think what you're doing is fantastic. How can I help? And we're so grateful for that. And it's it really, it, it means a lot, you know. It's, I love this thing that we're, you know, we've done uh, things with other YouTubers and everyone's friends and there's, you know, it's not a competition thing, everyone yeah, gets yeah, along. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I think you recognize that early on. It's like, you know, what you, I really like what you guys are doing. And you came on the show, sort of um, early early doors and it was brilliant so I just wanted to say a massive thank you ditto yeah well from that's, us. that's very very cool it's uh, as you say it's um, I don't know whether or not YouTube land will you know I guess inevitably as more people enter it and it, you know perhaps it becomes a little bit more crowded it will become by its very nature a bit more competitive but certainly the, the 10 odd years that I've been doing it it's been a very uh, or, or, largely friendly place mm, with, you yeah, know yeah. With, with everybody very supportive of what everybody else is trying to do which, mm. which is great but I always I said I always think you know to be to have the sort of success that that, that you've had on you know and, and and that we've had I suppose as well it has to be genuine absolutely you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it can't be because you think it might earn you some money? Yeah, you know it has yeah. to. It has to fundamentally, at the beginning, be. We um, are hoping that that might be the no. case one day. <laughs> oh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and I'd be lying if I said it. Well, it's, yeah, no, know, no, no. I, it, I'm, there I'm being is facetious. A, it, it's you know that there is you know it has it does have a commercial yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. value now, mm. whether it's on gig rig sales or yeah. or or. Um, income or merch sales yeah, yeah, through, yeah. you know it's like yeah. we are all now making a living well to some degree or another out of this but yeah somebody's if, got to pay for the champagne Lee. Let's yes <laughs> but, but it's fundamentally if the day one was the conversation where i'd sat down with rob or you'd sat down with yeah, yeah. Uh, each other and gone right no way how do we get to making five thousand a month out of making video oh, yeah. no 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 it I mean, would have been like it's a, it's it's just first year of first year of tps it was funded by being able to sit in the in the back of the mm. gig rig and film there for free yeah, yeah. and our time mm. and our collection of yeah. stuff. Yeah, because oh, it's not, wow. uh, you know, just to, just to create that point, it's, it's totally separate from Gig Rig, but it was just something that we had this, mm. we're, there's such a strong shared interest. It's like, mm. well, let's just do this. We and, can sit in the back know, of your office and make yeah, the yeah. videos. It's like, yeah, I've got yeah. some room here. This is where I've been making totally crap videos for a while. Yeah. Let's try and make something <laughs> decent in here. Yeah. And, you know, that's where it started. Well, people with girls banging on the walls going, shut up, you know. Down. Yeah, yeah. No. So, <laughs> is that a DC2? <laughs> my, my guess is that nobody watching this video won't have at least seen some of your videos. But if you're not familiar with that pedal show, TPS as it refers to it, um, it genuinely is one of the, one of the, the only utterly uh, independent, unbiased, uh, well, as biased, obviously. <laughs> not from commercially these biased. Two. Yeah, not commercially. You know, <laughs> totally so, biased so in terms you of can, And they do, <laughs> they do get some really cool and unusual kind of, a lot of the boutique-y kind of pedals. It's a very cool. And, you know, they're, and they're very honestly compared. Um, and, I, and I have to be honest with you, again, I should be thanking you because quite regularly when you go, wow, this is the best insert pedal type thing that we've heard in ages, sales are <laughs> like this. Um, and and so you know it's all good. Anyway, look. Yeah. Um, I don't know in which order these videos will come out, but uh, Dan has very kindly uh, agreed to wire up my pedal board. So we're going to go and have some lunch and then do that afterwards. So in that video, we're probably going to talk a little bit more about some of the actual gig riggy 
things that they make. But uh, anyway, I don't know how long you've been watching this for. It feels like this is potentially a big one. But thank you so much for you guys coming in. <laughs> thank you so much. And good Thanks luck with you, everything buddy. in the future. Cheers, Peter. Cheers, Taylor. Thanks, guys. Uh, and thank you for watching. And we shall see you soon on Anderton's TV.